Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Khaloud Ode, the Vice President of IT and Chief Information Officer at the Urban Institute. I joined Urban in 2014, and while many people think of me as a technologist at heart, I like to think of myself as a technologist with a heart. Um, my passion for technology always stems from its transformational impact on people's uh, lives. Before I begin my remarks, um, I would like to acknowledge our online audience who's tuned in today and encourage you all to share your thoughts or observation using hashtag live at urban. And for the online viewers, we welcome and encourage you to ask questions or share comments by emailing events at urban.org. At Urban, our mission is to elevate the debate by providing evidence-based analysis across a wide range of issue areas. We use research to solve real-world problems, and our work is centered around finding ways to improve opportunity for those at the bottom of the economic ladder. As a technologist, I spent 15 years of my career leading technology transformation in the nonprofit sector. I believe that technology transformation in the nonprofit sector evolved in three waves. A wave to transform to survive, transform to drive, and transform to thrive. 15 years ago, transforming technology in nonprofit was about survival and keeping the lights on. It was achieved and measured by cutting costs and securing as much free or donated technology and software licenses as possible. 10 years ago, we started seeing more technology in programmatic areas of organizations and bigger role for technologists in enabling and driving the missions of their organizations. In the last five years, we've seen the transform to thrive wave, where technologists have a seat at the table and technology and data not just enabling or driving the mission, but contributing directly to growth, increased impact, influence, and outreach by magnitudes. Today, I believe we are embarking on a new wave of digital transformation, where cloud technology, data science, storytelling, and data visualization are foundational elements for making the desired social change. I don't know what to call this wave yet. Some fancy technologists are calling it digital nonprofit. But for now, I would like to call it transform for the social change. The results of engaging data in decision making can be transformational. And one would find it difficult to identify a nonprofit leader or an organization which so fully embraces the power of data and technology as today's guest, the founder and CEO of Crisis Text Line, Nancy Lublin. Crisis Text Line the world's first 24-7 free text message-based support service for people facing a range of issues from depression and, uh, and substance abuse to eating disorders and physical abuse. With over 48 million texts exchanged since August 2013, Lublin expanded Crisis Text Line internationally, allowing people around the world to text in and get help. In 1996, second year, Law student Nancy received a $5,000 inheritance from her grand, great grandfather and decided to turn this gift into one that would keep giving. She founded dressforsuccess.org. Using crisis text line data, Lublin recently launched a separate initiative called Crisis Trends to track when and where issues occur, turning the gift of data into one that would keep giving. We are pleased to have Nancy here with us, who will first share a presentation highlighting Crisis Text Line's powerful work before sitting down with the Director of Urban Center on Nonprofit and Philanthropy, Dr. Sheena Ashley. We will have a QA following, and then we invite you all to stay for the reception. Now I'll turn it over to Nancy, and let's all give her a very warm welcome. Thank you for having me on a hot and sweaty DC September day. Are, are there any crisis counselors here? Just like to, okay, good. Um, 
uh, well, hopefully by the end of this, some of you will decide to be crisis counselors. So that's good. Um, so I thought what I would do is start by describing crisis text line and how it works and how we use data to make us faster, better, um, more accurate, uh, increase quality, and then end with a few thoughts on how I think about data in general that I hope are applicable to the work that you do. Does that sound like a good plan? Great, let's do this. Okay, so um, I was the CEO of DoSomething.org. Anyone familiar with DoSomething.org? Okay, Do Something is actually the largest organization for young people in America. It has 5.7 million members, um, maybe because it's not homophobic. Um, uh, so that is bigger than the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts combined, for anyone keeping track of that. But probably the real reason is because it uses text um, to engage with its members. Um, you, you all text, I'm guessing, you all text. <clears throat> Here's the beauty of text. There are only a few of you in this room who remember email and email spam like me, but um, email spam were things like, um, I'm a Nigerian prince. I left my wallet in a cab when I was in Korea. Um, if you send me $500, I will send you $5 million back. Or a lot of email about Viagra. Um, you weren't alone. We all got those emails. Okay, so. Um, uh, that killed email. That created the junk filter and spam filters, and email really lost its potency. Text messaging, mobile carriers make money on text messaging. So they don't want text spam. Right now, 80% of the messages being sent to you are being blocked by the mobile carriers. There are messages being sent about Viagra. There are messages being sent by Nigerian princes who lost their wallets. Um, they're being blocked by the mobile carriers because the mobile carriers don't want text messaging to die because they make money. Because of that, they self-regulated um, and they created the Cellular Telephone Industry Association that made all kinds of rules about how text messaging works, including that messaging has to be opt-in only. So you only text with things that you have opted into. For the most part, that's your family and your friends, right? You don't really text the brands. It's also do something.org. Many people, 5.7 million of them, have opted in to message do something.org, who every week sends a message about a campaign. So it might be a campaign about um, guns. It might be a campaign about um, high school suspensions and how they are unequally distributed to people of color. It might be a campaign about food pantries. And they will text message these out every week. A couple hundred thousand people will do these campaigns. And a couple dozen people will text back personal things. Because, of course, you feel connected to do something because you only text with your parents, your friends, and do something.org. So you feel close to it. And so people would share things about being bullied. They would share things about their best friend being addicted to crystal meth. Text is a fantastic way to market and make connections to people. But these things were out of flow. And so we would do what you do with what are called edge cases. We would triage them. Here is a hotline number. Maybe you should talk to your school principal. How does your mom know? We were doing the best we could with these. And then we got a message from a girl that was uh, much darker than the other messages we had received. It said, um, he won't stop raping me. It's my dad. He told me not to tell anyone. And then the letters, are you there? And someone printed that out and put it on my desk and was like, I don't know what to do with this one. And I said, OK, let's send them the phone number for RAIN, the Rape and Incest Organization. And the next morning, I came in and said, what happened? Did we hear back from her? Nope. I said, send it to her again. And the truth of the matter is, it's now been more than six years. Um, we've never heard back from her. I've personally taken that phone number and called to, tried to call her, tried to text her, never heard back. Um, I don't know if it was a burner phone, so it's not her number anymore. Uh, I don't know if her father saw that message. I don't know if she's dead or alive. And for the couple of weeks after that message, uh, you know, we all felt terrible. And I said, look, if they're going to share such personal things with us by text, somebody needs to build a hotline by text. So I set out to build Crisis Text Line. We launched August 1, 2013, so just over four years ago, very quietly in Chicago and El Paso. I wanted to see the difference between those markets. And within four months, we were in all 295 area codes in the United States. So for those of you who track things like organic growth and virality, that's faster geographic growth than when Facebook first launched. 
that is incredibly fast growth. And per your very kind introduction, we just passed 49 million messages. Actually, in a week and a half, we're going to pass 50 million messages exchanged. So 50 million messages in a little over four years. And to be clear, we think that our next 50 million messages will take nine months. So that is a very fast growth trajectory. Um, turns out text is a fantastic way to communicate with people, um, especially about personal uh, issues of pain. I thought, because I had watched every episode of Glee, I really thought that most of, by the way, I'm funny, and someone should have told you that. <laughs> there we go. So there's, a, there's some serious stuff, there's some funny stuff, hopefully there's going to be some smart stuff, I'm not sure, but I'm definitely sure I'll be funny. So um, I had seen every episode of Glee, and so I really thought all these messages were going to be about bullying, because every episode of Glee had some bullying in it. And 3% um, of our messages are about bullying. Um, very small percentage of our messages about bullying. Having said that, the interesting learning is, though, that cyberbullying co-presents often with suicidal ideation, not so much offline bullying, which I think is the beginning of one of those myths that gets busted by the data. So we're going to talk about the data. But there's an example right there of myths being busted. People think that somehow in-person bullying is um, more dangerous. And actually, it's the cyberbullying that co-presents more often with um, lethal thinking. 30% of our messages are about suicide and depression. Um, after that, it's anxiety. And then um, also in the top five issues we see, self-harm. Um, more than 10% of our texters indicate self-harm, primarily cutting. Um, this is an issue, we're amazed that it's more than 10% of our texters. And this is an issue that is just not talked about. Uh, anywhere. There is not an organization for self-harm. There are not activists and people talking about this everywhere, but it is happening a lot. Um, it is not that, it's not visible. It's usually flesh that's covered up, but this is happening a lot. So the kinds of issues that we see are very serious. 65% of people tell us they've shared something with us that they've never shared with another person. Text turns out to be a fantastic way to uh, share very personal things. Um, they've usually spilled their guts by the third message. By the third message, we've really heard what's going on. Text is private. It's anonymous. You don't feel judged because you're not hearing someone else's voice. You don't hear someone gasp or sound condescending. Um, you can do it in the heat of the moment, as opposed to waiting until after school or waiting until that meeting is over or until you have your next therapy appointment. You can do it in, you might be texting us now, and no one here would know. Um, so we have the opportunity to tip you from a hot moment to a cool moment right in that moment of impact. So text turns out to be fantastic. Let me tell you about the data. I tried to rush through so I, the, how we work. Um, there are about 3,600 active crisis counselors all over uh, doing this at home in their jammies while eating Doritos or whatever, um, uh, counseling strangers um, by text. Conversations average around 45 minutes or somewhere between 40 and 60 messages exchanged. And um, we have about an 86% quality rating on average. So 86% of texters telling us this conversation was helpful, which is pretty terrific because I asked, if I asked you right now who wants an ice cream cone, 86% of you might not say yes because some of you would be like lactose intolerant um, so, <laughs> or just wrong. So some of you just wouldn't want an ice cream cone on this hot day, which is just wrong. But um, you, we probably wouldn't hit 86% 80, is a very high approval rating, especially for a service where everybody texting us is miserable. Nobody's like, I got a promotion today, so I'm texting. Um, that's not how it works. So, um, so that is the service itself. Let's talk about the data. Um, so uh, I tend to think about data as a water well. Oftentimes, think, uh, people think of data and being data driven as we need to hire smart people, data scientists, who we go to and ask questions, and then they research it and come back with answers. And that drives the organization. And to uh, Khalud's uh, introduction, that's how specifically not-for-profits, but also for-profits, have been thinking about data for a long time. Let's um, layer in some really smart, smart software, bring in people who know how to use R or SPSS or any of those things, and we'll ask them for answers. And so that's kind of like going to someone and saying, can I have some water? And they hand you a bottle of water. We like to think of data as ETL and as a water well. Has anybody heard the term ETL before? ETL is how Silicon Valley is now talking about data. It's more like a water well, where if you need water, if you need data, you should be able to go to the well and dip it out yourself. Um, everybody in the company, everybody here at the Urban Institute should be able to go and get the data that they need to make smart decisions for whatever they're running. And that's ETL. 
It's no longer data driven. That's like the last 10 years. Um, this is um, uh, ETL, extract, transform, load. You can wiki it, there's lots written about it, um, but the idea is that the data is there as a well for you to dip into. And so at all levels of our organization, people have access to the numbers that they need to make smart decisions. Do you use Slack? A little bit? Okay, we live on Slack. Um, and there are plugins with Slack um, for live data. So here are some examples of water wells at Crisis Text Line. Every morning at 7 a.m., we post the organizational KPIs in an automated way. Nobody has to touch it. But every morning at 7 a.m., five KPIs are listed on a one-day and 28-day rolling basis. How many conversations we've had, how many textures we've had, the satisfaction rating, the, uh, what am I missing? The satisfaction rating, the um, wait time, and how many crisis counselors were on. So those things for the past 24 hours and the past 28 days, every single morning at 7 a.m. Everybody in the organization, from our office manager to me, the CEO, to our board, we are all seeing the same data and working off those same metrics every single day. Um, that's one example of a water well that everybody can dip into. Another example is every 30 seconds on Slack, it updates and tells us what's going on on the platform itself. How many crisis counselors are on, how many conversations they're handling, how many supervisors are on, and how many suicidal people are on the platform at that moment. How many high risk conversations are on there every 30 seconds on my phone. I could be on an airplane somewhere and I could see this. I could be in another country on vacation looking at my phone, which I shouldn't be doing, but you know what I mean. Um, the idea is that this is a water well that anybody can dip into. It means that when we make decisions in the organization, the question is not, well, what would the data say? The question is not, what information are we missing? We're all on the same team. We're all working off the same baseline and we're making informed decisions. Does that make sense? That's how we think. Um, and sometimes when we get stuck and we can't make a decision, the question is that we don't have the right data. We don't have the information that we're all working on. So let me give you some examples of hard decisions and smart decisions that have been made based on the data. When we first launched, we put out an RFP and uh, we had three crisis centers around the United States who answered the messages. We thought of ourselves just as the technology, just as the pipes, and we'd farm out the content, which is fairly common. Does that make sense? Technology versus content. For the most part, you pick one or the other. You're either the dist distribution or you're the thing that fills the distribution. You're the content. We really thought we were the pipes. And so we contracted with three uh, crisis centers to do the messaging. As you can hear from our growth trajectory, we quickly needed three more and three more. And we eventually got to 11 crisis centers handling conversations around the country. And what we saw by looking at the data was that they were wildly disparate. Some of them, the very first thing they asked was, are you feeling suicidal today? Excuse me. Some of them you know, prefer different language over others. And so we scraped the best practices that we saw and trained our own 12th cohort and very quickly saw that they outperformed. They were faster. They had higher quality ratings. And of course, they were cheaper because they were volunteers helping us as opposed to uh, paying um, any other center. So in 2015, we pivoted the entire business model we pushed off those 11 crisis centers, and we raised up our own now over 3,600 crisis counselors who we trained ourselves. We basically built a small college, if you think about it. We've now trained online over 10,000 people who can handle conversations. And like I said, 3,600 of them have been active in just the last 28 days. That was a big decision, and that was based on the data, on those KPIs, and the fact that they outperformed. Um, and so we pivoted to that model. Another example, at one point in time, uh, early last year, early in 2016, we noticed that 3% of our texters were using 34% of our volume. That sucks. I mean, if I were selling donuts, that'd be great. You just hit them with some Facebook ads, sell them some more donuts, and I'd be rich, right? Like, or if I was Amazon, that's great. You move that 3% to like 4% and you're happy. But as a service provider, uh, that's not good. You, you, that's not good math. And so there are three ways that you can solve a problem like this. Um, well, how would you solve this? 3% using 34% of your volume. Those are 3% of our textures who are just what you would call chronic textures. So how would you solve this? Thoughts? Diego. You give them uh, skills to cope. Give them their own coping skills. That's right. So have basically a different way of working with them. Anyone else? 
talk to them. Okay, so a lot of people suggested, why don't you hire supervisors to just help the chronics? Um, I had more than one person say, this is a great project for McKinsey, which really made me laugh. Um, uh, lots of ideas. Yep. Have them talk to each other, so peer support. So these, most of these, with the exception of Diego's, are what I would consider people solutions, right? So based on people. Um, there are also policy solutions, like, have, like Diego's suggestion, have a different set of policies that apply to that 3%. The third potential solution is products. Most people tend to problem solve in that order. People, policies, products. Crisis Tech Sign is a tech company that happens to do mental health not a mental health organization that happens to have a lot of technology. So we solve things, product, policies, people. So what we did was we built some products. We built an automatic flag um, that labeled them chronic so that when they came in, we knew who, that we were talking to someone who was part of that 3% automatically. Um, we stack ranked them in the queue. We knew that these are people who were going to be safe. They were largely just lonely. So we gave them higher wait times and put them lower down in the queue. Um, we built management plans for them. Um, that automatically popped up, that culled uh, the coping skills and the referrals that we've given them in the past, like Joey just needs to be reminded to take his inhaler, just tell Joey to take his inhaler and he'll be good. So those things pop up in that management plan. Um, and now 3% uh, of our texters are taking about 9% of our volume. Um, so we solved it with product. And that's really how tech companies think. Um, and that's how you think systems-wise, that was a heck of a lot cheaper and more effective, and we could track it by thinking products, policy, people, in that order. Another way that we've used data to make us faster and more accurate is the stack ranking that I mentioned. Um, so when we first built this, we put in the words in the algorithm like die, um, suicide, overdose, and we knew we wanted to take those textures first, right? Like. Uh, <coughs> I think all customer service should work this way. Uh, like when you're flying and your flight is in an hour and you call Delta, they should take you before the family that's like planning for spring break. Yes, all customer service should work this way and should stack rank us. Sadly, they don't. But at a crisis hotline, it was in, it's incredibly important that we do. So we put those words in the queue and that was, that was very helpful um, for the algorithm. And then we added a machine learning layer. Do you know, uh, when I talk about machine learning, you know that Terminator, okay, right, good, great. So, um, so um, this is the algorithm getting smarter based on more usage. Think about it, 50 million messages in four years. We have what a data corpus really needs to be strong. Volume, velocity, and variety. Just If you learn nothing else today, you'll sound super smart if you can talk about that tonight. Like any cocktail party, call Nidre later this week, whatever. Volume, <laughs> velocity, variety. The three of you understood that joke, thank you. So volume. <laughs> Volume, velocity, and variety, that's what makes a data corpus super strong. 50 million messages, we have a very valuable data corpus. So we layered on a machine learning layer to see, um, okay, so what really, when really do we end up calling 911? When are the times where we can't de-escalate, where we can't get you from a hot moment to a cool moment, and we have to call 911? And it turns out there are n-grams, bigrams, and trigrams, so words and families of words that are more likely for us to call 911 than the word suicide. Do you want to take a guess what those are? Murder. What else? Other guesses? I'm trying to be a little interactive here. <laughs> it's a hot day. Go ahead, Diego. What do you think the top words are? Uh, Tylenol. Ty well, you know. You've seen me <laughs> say this. OK, so he's cheating. Diego's cheating. We'll forgive him. Um, so yes, the number one family of words, Tylenol, Advil, um, uh, ibuprofen, aspirin, those words are 16 times more likely for us to call 911 than the word suicide. Um, the word military, four times more likely for us to have to trigger an active rescue. And the unhappy face crying emoji, six times more likely for us to have to trigger an active rescue. We also discovered the hashtag KMS. Kill myself, exactly. So these are things that the algorithm discovered. And now we stack rank based on those words in the queue. And this is a way that, again, we are faster than if the human eye would just determine um, you know, what makes sense to take first, second, third. And that's how we stack rank the queue. So this is about data and technology being used uh, to make us faster, smarter, more accurate, make hard decisions. I'm now supposed to ask you about q and I have no idea which parts of this are interesting to you, but let's do this. What you got? Yeah. Can you talk about the context of like, the Tylenol and the 
I just swallowed a bottle of Tylenol. Um, I'm thinking of swallowing a bottle of Tylenol. That means you not only have the ideation and the plan, but you have the means. Tylenol is within five feet of us right now. Um, and you have the timing. It's imminent. Um, that's much worse than I want to die. Uh, I want to kill myself, which sounds so much more direct than I just took a bottle of Tylenol. But I want to die. I want to kill myself. You might not have a plan. Um, and you might not be doing it in the next 24 hours. But I just swallowed a bottle of Percocet even. Follow on? Yep. Okay. Uh huh. So those were for the chronics, who they're not high risk. If they were high risk in the stack ranking, that would put them number one in the queue. But these are people who are not high risk. They're just chronic users and managed texters who we have often. So. Um, uh, that's again, you make different decisions. Here's the thing about data. Um, it's not um, objective. Um, data is subjective. Um, you decide as the one who manages it, what are you going to prioritize? You decide how you're going to query it. Um, uh, you make sure, so it's basically collection, storage, and analysis. All three things are what you do with a data corpus at all three of those phases. How you collect and who you collect from, how you store it, and what you analyze. There are human hands on all three of those um, layers of data analytics. And all three of those are impure, right? So um, we decide what we're gonna, what, how we're going to collect this and who we're going to collect from. Our database, for example, 75% under the age of 25. So everything that I just told you skews for young people in America. Don't take what I just said as uh, incredibly applicable for 55-year-old men who are de depressed. Um, so that's the collection. Storage, how you store it, how you tag it, um, you know, uh, what you decide to keep and not keep. Um, and then thirdly, how you analyze it, what you're querying and what you pull. So for that stack ranking, we have decided that imminent risk is the most important thing we do, not chronology. Do you want to shift to here and yeah, take questions well, from there? Up. Okay, all right, great, sorry. To the audience that's joining us by webcast because they can't hear oh, great, questions sorry. without a mic. We'll switch to this format and we'll be very quick to take more of your questions because if you're like me, this is super interesting to you. But you do not steal my time to have a conversation with Nancy. <laughs> I've been waiting for this for months. So uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Sheena Ashley. I have the enormous privilege of directing the Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy, where my fabulous team is in the room, and it's their <laughs> great idea. Thank you, Joy. I'm who, here because of Joy. Yes, her first day on the job, she said, I could get you Nancy, and I was like, you are hired, you will come here. <laughs> if you can get me Nancy. So this is real, like that is great, great enormous first contribution to the team. She's been wonderful um, so far. So I'm really looking forward to doing this. I am a data, just aficionado. I do this all day, was a stats professor, so I love it. And then to have this conversation in the context of nonprofit management and then what we can do to drive greater impact is really a passion and bringing those two worlds together um, very well here. So happy Hi. to have this conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm supposed to say, as a reminder for those in the room or tuning in on the webcast, there will be Q&A after this little bit of time. Oh, sorry. I jumped the uh, I you love can either, Q and a That's yeah, my I know. bad. You can either ask a question directly or submit questions to events at urban.org so that we can have questions that come in off the web. And also uh, join the conversation on Twitter, hashtag live at urban. OK, let's jump in. I'm going like, to throw away all let's the questions this. that I had because you raised so many. OK. Answers. And my head is spinning just on stacking and uh, everything that you said. Okay. okay. So how you said an important thing to me in that conversation. Mm. You are a tech company who happens mm -hmm. to do mental health, not a mental health service organization that has a big tech corpus. And when I've been thinking about your organization all the time, I'm like, yes, they're a social service organization who has this fabulous tech corpus. And then we can like generalize that to the rest of the nonprofits in the room. What, you still can. That term. Yeah, you like still can and you still should. There are lots of things to learn from how we operate at Crisis Tech Sign that apply to both social service organizations, not-for-profits, government, and for-profits. But um, the way that we operate, the way we were talking in the, in the green room about how we hire, for example, um, how we um, rotate leadership roles. So um, we don't require a college degree um, to work at Crisis Tech Sign. 
We have for the supervisor roles like that Naya is in, we have said in the past that you have to have a master's degree in a relevant field. And we've looked at the data now, and our best supervisors do not necessarily have a master's degree in a relevant field, so screw it. Um, frankly, especially because master's degrees tend to suggest class more than intelligence or experience. So why have that bias? Um, so we're, we really operate more like a tech company. And that's not a conversation you'd hear starting first from a tech company. So how, tell us a little bit about, we'll just try to get into the details of the organization. To me, what's your staffing yeah. like? Are you all data scientists there or There's MSW? four. That's, there's four data scientists on a staff of 70. That's not, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, and so look, let me explain what I mean by a tech company. Yeah. I really mean two things. Um, so um, one is um, how we think how we solve problems. So I said before, products, policy, people. The reason we think that way is a third of our team writes code or is in product design or data, a third of the team, including at least a third of the C-suite of the executive team. And here's why I think that matters. Uh, what did you study as an undergrad? Agricultural economics. OK, there you go. <laughs> right, that's amazing. Um, and I did political science, and then I did political theory for a master's degree. So I studied dead white men. Like, Things that had been around for hundreds of years, and I was told to read Machiavelli because like, it had lasted the test of time. Awesome. And the th awesome, <laughs> super fun to read. But um, so, uh, <laughs> so here's the thing about all those people who write code or touch data. They build things and ship things that every three to six months, they know mm -hmm. it's either going to break or be outdated. That is normal. Like It's constantly breaking. It's really frustrating for me. For them, that's normal. They are constantly iterating. So right now, we're all about Slack. My guess is in 12 months, we'll be using something else. You know, people were on Skype, then they were on BlueJeans, we were using Google Hangout. It's constantly changing, and that's not annoying. It's exciting. It's normal to constantly iterate. And so when that is a third of your DNA, and they're not like in the basement on their own, but actually every six months, we put all the names in a hat. We call it the reaping, like from the Hunger Games, but nobody dies. And, um, and we pull them out one at a time, and you pick a desk. So people who write code are like right next to supervisors and right next to the finance team. So everybody's mixed up. When that's normal and part of the DNA of your company, everybody's failing all the time and it's awesome. Everybody is innovating. Everybody is trying to solve problems with products. And that's what makes us a tech company, one. The second thing that makes us a tech company is I think there are two tracks. Um, I think there are two tracks at, at Crisis Text Line. One is come. And be there for like a year to two years. And, and think of this as a cheaper business school or a cheaper MSW. And then go do something else. That's fine. Like come, give me, give me something for a while. Um, give me your time. Give me your heart. And then leave and take that to another organization. Or you can be on a partner track. And that's how like, the best companies work. That's you know, JetBlue. That's um, people we would say Goldman Sachs. Um, uh, McKinsey, like that's how some of the best in class in their fields companies work. There are two tracks. There's come and be there for a short stint or be here for life, be here forever, um, and, um, and think about it that way, um, like, a, like a hospital okay. where there's a fellowship, there's or, a fellowship or you're there forever. That. That's what I think makes us a tech company. So you mentioned 70 staff, but you, to have that much volume of techs, you have all of these volunteers. How do you manage this? broad network of volunteers and ensure quality? You know, Instagram, when Instagram was bought, um, Instagram had 12 employees. I mean, some of these major systems work entities, thanks to products, don't need a ton of staff. The math is really beautiful. Um, that includes, by the way, a do something. So you heard the do something numbers that I gave, 5.7 million. There are, again, about 65 staff in the Do Something headquarters for 5.7 million members. Compare that to the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts has about 2.1 million members, and their national headquarters, just their national headquarters, has 350 people in it, okay. let alone all the people in those local offices around the country. The thing about tech companies and the way that you can leverage technology and data is that um, your cost centers are totally different. So at Crisis Tech Sign, yeah, we have a small central team. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, even with conversations, right? With 3,600 volunteers, um, I can handle five conversations at a time on a platform. Whereas by phone, a phone hotline is a one-to-one -one ratio. This is more like an accordion that expands. Amazing. So that you're able to reach so much scale so fast. Do you see this as 
the future of nonprofit service delivery and no, technology enabling us to do that in other parts? Uh, I see this, this is just the future of companies, not for profit and for profit. For profits have been thinking this way for a long time. Um, it's time that we think this way too. This it actually makes more sense for not for profits and social service, service organizations because we don't have extra cash right. lying around. Um, and frankly, because we're dealing with the world's biggest problems, you know, Uber isn't. Um, trying to get me home all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice, but like we have given so much heat and attention, and we've given our smartest minds to some of the stupidest companies. I'm ready for our smartest minds to be here. I have a be, lot of them. That's great. Um, but that people should be clamoring. Like, you know, it should be like people are fighting for these positions and these are the sexiest jobs in America, not, um, I'm sorry, but like Facebook is helping you see photos of your friend's kids now? Yeah. Why is that important? And they're fucking our democracy, apparently. Yeah. So why is that important? Yeah. So, um, oh, I also have a potty mouth, sorry. It's all right. So, um, it's only going over the web okay, and great. everything. And I'm fine with that. Facebook probably saw that too. Yeah. We're not streaming live on Facebook. <laughs> Um, yeah. Live at Urban. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that these ideas need to be applied to not-for-profits and social change organizations and activism, yeah. frankly. And you've seen a lot of this. You've seen, I mean, you've seen movements take off and scale thanks to um, leveraging these tools. So how do you get the funding community to think about this and to get on track with this change? How did you do this to have an organization in mental health? Like where, how are you cobbling together the funding and convincing them that this is the right approach? Um, so this is not my first rodeo. Yeah. And I'm used to doing the hand to mouth thing. I'm also used to doing dinners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't even like going to those dinners, let alone throwing them. Um, and I mean like, it's unbelievable that in the not-for-profit, do you guys have to do a dinner? You probably do a dinner at the Urban Institute. Oh, do you yeah, do we a do dinner We here? do dinners, you yeah. Do dinners. <laughs> like, it basically means we're wedding planners. It's true. Like, I did not go into this line of work amazing event to, to, to have my board yell at me about the fact that they're at a table in the back of the room instead of the front of the room, okay. or that the auction items weren't good. Screw you. I'm not a wedding planner. <laughs> so um, I decided if we were going to grow at the pace of a tech company, we should raise money like a tech company. And I decided to raise money in rounds. So um, we basically had a, a seed round and a series A. I mean, there's no equity. There's no return, but frankly, most of their investments are busted anyway. So you're just going into this one knowing there's not going to be a liquidity moment. Um, and then uh, in 2016, I, d I raised a Series B round. I went out to raise 20 million, was my goal. Um, so 20 million in unrestricted money. Um, and in, from March till June of 2016, I actually raised closer to 26. So break that down for us. What does that mean? You went out to raise 20 million and got 26. I had like a hat in my hand. You just went to I Silicon Valley. And, offices <laughs> and I shuffled. Um, <laughs> close. Um, no, I, I met, yeah. I started in Palo Alto and I got one person, I got Reed Hoffman to agree to give us 5 million. That was a great podcast, by the way. Oh, thank Reed you. Hoffman. Masters of Scale. Love that on Masters of Scale. Sound editing is so it's good. Amazing. No pressure, whoever's yeah. doing this. But <laughs> sound editing is so good. I know. So, um, so I got Reed to agree to give us five million uh, leveraged, if if I could get ten. So if I get a two to one match, he would give us five, and then I went from there um, to Seattle, and um, and 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 got money there, and it, it's, it snowballed from there. So it wasn't just New York based. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have Actually, the perception now that, I think about that it, none of the money came from New York. Interesting. I don't know anybody in finance. <laughs> I should. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm ready, but I don't. My second husband is going to be a rich hedge fund guy. I tell this to my husband all the time. <laughs> so what will be that next enterprise? I mean, you are a change maker. You've redone I'm having a pretty good time doing this. Your, your, your introduction was very generous. We have not done the rest of the world yet, working on it. So we're going to launch Canada and the UK this fall. Um, and uh, uh, we'd love to bring this to 20 countries in the next three years okay. so that we can map uh, mental health globally and make the case. I mean, we talk about mental health in America a little bit, and frankly, this rising generation, which I'm seeing in this room, you are much better at talking about mental health than like our generation. We are not good at talking about this. Um, Y'all talk about it all the time, um, which is great because the stigma is being reduced, and that's fantastic in this country, not the rest of the world. There are parts of the world where there's no such thing as domestic violence. Um, it, if you're married, you can do whatever um, to your spouse. Um, you know, there's all, there's all kinds. So what we want to do is bring this to 20 countries around the world and map it. I recommend you check out Crisis Trends. 
data.org. I left that out. I talked all about how we use data to make us better. I didn't talk about making the rest of the world better with data. We've essentially aggregated and anonymized our data to help other people. So look at crisistrends.org. We'd like to build a global version of that to help make the case for mental health around the world and show um, where things are happening. Interesting thing on that also will be that we'll have to have apples to apples uh, definitions, yeah. right? Because when I talked about collection storage analysis, collection means uh, definitions, right? So like, what is domestic violence? We'll have to define it. We'll have to define um, what is sexual abuse. We will have to define those terms so the data coming in is pure. And interestingly, we will have to have one definition of those things. So think about this with me. In 20 countries, those 20 countries all have different definitions of those things now. That's great. That's, that's nice. You can, you can do that. But we will have our own. This is an example of where a tech company will be ahead of local legislation. Um, so um, this is another example of people, policy, product, instead changing things, product, policy, people. Because we will be defining these things a certain way, collecting data for those 20 countries, we will be pushing the needle, pushing, pushing the envelope, pick your metaphor. On, um, on how these things are defined without even bothering to have like 20 people on the ground and spend millions of dollars lobbying a local government to care about domestic violence or sexual abuse. Instead, um, this is an example of the user getting ahead of legislation and policy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So how are you engaging policy now in the United States and you're ambitious for doing that? You have crisistrend.org so people can learn from what you're surfacing, but how is your organization not well. doing this? I, th I think we're not doing this one well. We were just talking to someone the other day, and I learned that I didn't even know what GR was, government relations. Yeah, I just learned that term. Huh. And so we've opened the data. Anybody can use it. We have heard from some people. Governor Kasich's office in Ohio contacted us and said, can you help us with opioid addiction? So we gave them a white label version of Crisis Text Line, which we're happy to do for anyone. It's basically your own version of Crisis Text Line. You pick a keyword, so they picked for hope, I have no idea why, but they picked for hope, and they've spread that around Ohio. So we now have more, what? Volume, velocity, variety nice. from Ohio, which means we can learn things from the data. So we're looking at opioid addiction in Ohio. Turns out when we looked at that, we noticed that Ohio was one of the highest states for self-harm and cutting also. So that was a, a big epiphany for Ohio. So we've done this for locations like states and cities. We've also done this for issue-based organizations like the National Eating Disorders Association. Instead of starting their own text line, we said, we'll give this to you. So they picked text NEDA, N-E-D-A, National Eating Disorders mm -hmm. Association, to our number, 741-741, and then, and then we help. And then the data doesn't get fragmented. It all comes in through one place. It gets automatically tagged coming in from those organizations or locations. Um, but that's kind of as far as we've gone with some of the policy work. We are not a C4. We don't do policy work. Instead, what we've decided to do is open up the data and let you or anybody else take it and run with it. Again, we think data is like water. And everybody should be able to dip into it and use it to nourish themselves. I love that waterfall approach to data. And there has been such a big part where we think opening data and we push it out is still enough but really doing the transition to make Live it data. people can actually use it. Right? Yeah. I think what a lot of people, and especially what a lot of social service organizations are doing is snapshots. What they're really sharing is metrics. What they're really sharing is goals and things achieved. They're not really sharing data. Data, um, the other, our chief data scientist coined this. He really thinks of data, he talks about it as um, uh, us as like a data org, but organism. Mm. And he said, um, think about it, when your hand touches a stove, you automatically recoil because it's, it's hot. And there are nerves everywhere on your body that will feel something and react without you really consciously thinking. And that's how data ought to work in an organization. You ought to function more like an organism where every aspect of the company has data coming in. And sometimes you react in automated ways to that data. Um, and sometimes you have to make conscious decisions. But everywhere you are has a nerve ending. That's really, is there, is there a point where you're too transparent with your data, thinking about privacy concerns or uh, showing false positives or, you know, what's So the, we scrub. We uh, do a lot of PII scrubbing, personally identifiable information scrubbing. We do a lot of PII scrubbing. One of the most beautiful things about Crisis Text Line is um, the veil of ignorance. Mm -hmm. That um, when someone texts in, um, you don't know really anything about that person. In fact, um, over 18% of our texters right now are identifying as Hispanic. Mm. 
which is pretty amazing since we're still an English only service. Um, but 18%, so about one in five texters identifies as Hispanic. And I don't think our crisis counselors are thinking I'm talking to someone Hispanic. I think they're just thinking I'm talking to a person. And so instead of, um, um, it's a veil of ignorance. Um, and so I don't think there's a lot of racial profiling going on. Um, we can preserve their anonymity and their privacy. Um, there's something else that we built. Um, actually, this is a great story. Can I tell oh, you a great yeah. side story? This is a great side story. Um, so I used to be on the board of the New School in New York, like Parsons or the New School. Okay, And um, we were going to give a degree to one of my close friends, to Van Jones. And yeah, an honorary degree. And two weeks before graduation, this is a really funny story. Two weeks before graduation, this is a couple years ago, Van calls me and is like, Nancy, you're going to kill me. I just got invited to something. I think I've got a bail on getting that honorary degree. And I was like, dude, this is two weeks from now. This is kind of a big deal. You're killing me. And he was like, all right, I won't go if you really, but I really want to do this other thing. And I was like, tell me what this other thing is. So he had been invited to Necker, to Richard Branson's private island. Yeah. And I was like, uh, <laughs> that's and I was better. Like, all right, here's how I'm not going to hate you. You've got to bring me with you. <laughs> so, so he's like, all right. So, so he tells Richard Branson's team, like, Nancy's my plus one. And they contact me. And I'm like, fine, forget the news call. So they, <laughs> so, so they contact me. I told you it's a good story. So they, they contact me to get my information. I have my assistant be like, please let them know that Van and I are actually married to other people. Right. And, and that I've never been anybody's plus one in my life. And like, here's my, here's my bio and stuff. And so they write and they say, oh, will you also speak? Because like, it's like this thing with yeah. social change people speaking and then like rich people. And so, so um, they're like, this is great. Because shocker, they didn't have a woman speaking. And I was like, well, my vagina and I will be there. So, <laughs> so, so, so I go to Necker. And I give, and I get, and like I've idolized Richard Branson, right? Like I was an entrepreneur before you could spell the word entrepreneur. Yeah. I wrote a college essay on him. I'm freaking out. Um, it was a little uncomfortable giving a speech in a bathing suit, but that's a different story. So, <laughs> so I give my talk, and um, Richard Branson and his children are. are fin I finish. I'm like crying in part of my speech. It's really embarrassing. And I stop, and it goes silent. And he, and I have a bad British accent, but I'm gonna try. He goes, "Fucking brilliant." That was not. <laughs> that was. And I was like, "Oh my god." And so he says, like, how can I help? So Richard Branson says to you, now you're standing there in a bathing suit on Necker, but he says to you, how can I help? What do you say? I mean, I did not ask him for money. Instead, I said, the privacy and anonymity of our textures is super important to us. Wow. The mobile carriers are really hard to get to. Could you please reach out to the four mobile CEOs in America and ask them to pull, um, pull our number completely so that we don't get charged a fee, Textures don't get charged a fee, and more importantly, we don't show up in their bills. Nice. And he says, done, give me an email. So I give him an email. I find the mobile CEO's, the, the four mobile carrier CEO's email addresses, and, um, and Richard Branson sends them a note. And within hours, all four of them are like, it's done, we're in. So I just give you another reason. <laughs> There's another reason to love not just Richard Branson, but Van Jones. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and like you just convinced me, this is not replicable, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining myself in a bathing suit in Necker. That's not gonna happen. Uh, I mean, there was, you get there, was there was a wrap. There was a cover. There was a wrap. There was a cover. There was there was definitely a cover. I'm gonna auction that off. Are you? Yeah, kidding? I know. Let's establish that now. <laughs> like, this is the thing that's gonna yeah. make it. So okay. So absent an invitation. <laughs> yeah. What can people in this room learn from your model? Like, what is the biggest takeaway you want them to know about how you first, how you built the business in the organization there, but also where you're going next with it? I think think about products, policy, people. I think thinking about data as a well that everyone should be able to access and learn from. If you're having a problem, if you're, if you're uh, disagreeing philosophically with someone else and you can't come to that decision, what's the piece of information that's missing? Because you're both good people and you care about the same kinds of things. So what's the piece of information that you have and the other person doesn't have or that you both are missing? Um, so thinking about data that way as, as really helping you formulate um, good decisions. And then I think thinking about systems work. Um, so I suppose we could do more government work and you know one at a time go to different. I'm not that psyched about coming to DC right now, but um, I'm glad you all are doing it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stay in New York. but. Um, uh, I guess we could go like meet with agencies and be like, here's our, here's our data, sir. Can I have some more? Yeah. And you know, like Oliver, what, anyway, so, and uh, we could go one at a time. I'd rather just open it up and make it public on crisistrends.org. Like that's the thing, you could go one at a time 
or you can change a whole system. The one example I have is one of our supervisors had an idea, we need more crisis counselors. People are in graduate school for an MSW and things like that. So, um, and they need practicum hours. So why don't we just recruit them to be crisis counselors? And I was like, great, but practicum hours means they need supervision, right? Yes, one hour a week they have to debrief. And I said, okay, so how many of these could we actually do? She said, well, we could partner with maybe four or five MSW programs, and maybe we could have 20 to 30 people. And I was like, that's adorable. And I was like, here's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in making our training you know, open online so that we can have like 10,000 people in the next six months go through it. So systems, systems thinking, sometimes when you hit your head against the wall with a problem, the real answer is to actually make the problem bigger, not smaller. Mm. That's really that sounded smarter than I know that was <laughs> that, that hit very well yeah. and, and especially a lot of us we especially because we start from people first we yeah. think we make our organizations bigger and once we're at a bigger organization we'll reach scale or people will recognize us and the power of what we bring to the table by the size of our organizations right yeah. like this is how we think about nonprofit size it when is. We're counting. you know it's like how nonprofits start by saying like measuring our things yeah. and we say to each other like how big are you and what we mean is how many staff do you have exactly and that's not how for-profits roll they talk about market cap they talk about how big their influence is like Instagram would have never been like well we're 12 people so why don't you buy us for 100 grand right. yeah and said they were like this is how big we are it's going to cost you 11 billion dollars to buy us that was a bold request so being proud about being small starting thinking about your impact yeah. instead of your staff size yeah that's really interesting. Okay, people are bursting to get questions in here. And I know, so I'm going to flip it a little bit because you brought, which is a really good sign of your leadership uh, and your ability to elevate others. You brought Naya here. Um, and to make it easier for you guys to have a conversation with the audience, I'm going to ask Naya to come up and take my place. Okay. It's going to make everybody else really upset right now, but I think it's the way to do it. Um, and she'll take the mic, and I'll be asking Syracuse questions. From Syracuse. From, it's I fine. know, yeah, orange. Yeah. We're all in it Good. today. Um, but I'll ask questions from the um, web. So okay. if you'll go ahead, and people can send in their questions, I'll take those. You got one that sounds like they're from the web. That's right. Okay. So let's start with the one from the web, right? Okay. How do you adjust or account for noise created by the algorithms in your data? Um, they do create noise. We build the algorithms. Um, so again, collection storage analysis is the game, and there are humans behind all three of those. So um, I would say the only thing that sometimes can get noisy is it can get really fun. We have such a big corpus that um, we can build things that aren't necessary, um, but are like fun and interesting. And so having those few KPIs and having those like couple of organizational priorities and having everybody in the company know what those organizational priorities are is super important so we're all on the same page. You were waiting, I know, for a while. Yep, hi. Um, you were mentioning about your satisfaction ratings yep. that you gather. And I'm curious about how and when you gather that information. So you, do you text and say, I'm glad you just stopped down uh, step down off the roof ledge. Um, how is my performance? <laughs> Smiley face, frowning yeah. face. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, we put in an LOL. No. Um, so at the end of a conversation, we sent, we closed the conversation out, and then there's an automated message generated that says, "We're always looking to improve. Um, do you mind sharing your thoughts with us?" And it's a link, so it's not a text message back. It's a link to, I think it's Survey Gizmo, um, that people take. We right now have about 19% of people fill out that survey, which is pretty good. Um, Just speaking of impact, uh, beyond uh, consumer satisfaction data, do you measure, it sounds like you measure your market uh, penetration in any region or metro you're in, in terms of your startup data, you sound, it sounded like that. Do you ever try to uh, marry that penetration rate to actual drops in the suicide rate on a population level? We haven't yet. Um, right now, we're focused on, the, on our own data internally to make us, like I said, faster and more accurate. Um, we haven't benchmarked yet. I think we're tiny right now. We haven't benchmarked yet against other data sets. That's, that stuff gets fun. You know, pulling socioeconomic status data, pulling local population data, like you said, adjusting for population. We know right now we skew young, poor, and rural um, if you match us against other public data sets. Um, so we know that. So for example, 5% of our texters identify as Native American. 
even though only one and a half percent of America identifies as Native American. Um, so that stuff is interesting, but we haven't done any of that local work yet, in part because we're not doing any marketing. I mean, we haven't tried to saturate the market in Nevada or anywhere else. We're just dealing with organic growth. And this is, again, where we think of ourselves as a tech company rather than a mental health organization. Here's our service. Like, take advantage of it. Um, you go for it. Like, if there's a state that you care about or a population that you care about, we'd be happy for you to market Crisis Text Line, and we'll give you the data about how we're doing, and you can see whether or not we're penetrating that market. Um, so uh, I'm fine with that. Great. That's you. Uh, what is the thing that you have the hardest time measuring? What do you think? I'm going to pull Nye. Nye is one of our supervisors. She's also the head of referrals. What do you think we have the hardest time measuring? So my answer is going to reflect referrals. Yeah. I would say knowing what the value is to the texter. So we share these resources, but we don't, right now we don't have data to say was this valuable to the texter. We know which referrals are being used most widely, but we don't know the relationship between value to the texter. But we're about to solve that. Do you want to talk about the bit, bit Oh, yes. So um, we're revamping the database at the moment, and we plan to include bit.ly links. So we will be able to track um, how many people are clicking through to these links. And we'll also be training the algorithm so that it'll begin to give auto-suggested materials to the uh, volunteers when they're in a certain situation, or a conversation, rather. That's going to be really fun. That data is going to be really neat. Um, the other thing that, that, that we haven't been able to measure in the past that was really challenging and that we solved, here's another example of solving something in a really interesting way. The supervisors were saying, and the crisis counselors were saying, it's really frustrating when we do an active rescue. Um, so when we do an active rescue, again, is when someone has the ideation, the plan, the means, and the timing, they're at imminent risk for harm to self or someone else, so suicide or homicide, and we have to call 911 because we can't de-escalate it. And one of the supervisors said, I know more when I order a pizza from Domino's than I do when I call 911. Have you ever used Domino's Pizza Tracker? Like, your order's being processed. Your pizza's being made. Your pizza's in the oven. Your pizza's on the way. And so I was like, shit, let's build a pizza tracker. <laughs> so we did. We built a pizza tracker. The pizza tracker is um, 911 has been contacted. And um, someone's being dispatched. And they've got your texture. 911, they're at the door doing a wellness check. And so now the supervisor, the crisis counselor, everybody has the same information. It's right there in front of them. It's literally the circles that like light up just like Pizza Tracker, except there's no little guy. You know, if you, if you really are familiar with Domino's, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, anyway, it's embarrassing. And I do like pineapple on my pizza, and I'll, I'm willing to wrestle you over that one. So anyway, so, um, so Pizza Tracker, here's the most exciting thing about Pizza Tracker. Um, where do you think I'm about to go with Pizza Tracker? So, so far it's really helped as a service, and it's, it's made things more transparent. Systems work. Where am I going to go with Pizza Tracker? Come on, guys. Did you learn anything from the last hour? Better. We've done about 10,000 active rescues. What am I sitting on? Data. What kind of data? I've got time stamps of those 10,000 active rescues when we've called and when they've dispatched for all of the 911s all over the country. I know the fast and slow police departments in the United States. I know what happens in downtown Detroit versus Gross Point. Yeah. That's what data does. That systems work. What I really want to do is open up Pizza Tracker and get other organizations that deal with 911 to also use Pizza Tracker. So that corpus, again, has what? Volume, velocity, variety. And so that, that Pizza Tracker becomes super uh, valuable. And the time stamps and the information there changes everything about how 911 and police departments work. You want to talk to someone? You, you were asking me. Joy was asking me before how I feel about criminal justice work. How you like me now? <laughs> <laughs> data. Data. In the back, hi. What demographic data do you collect? So you've mentioned a couple. And, do you, uh, and what, yeah, what have you found on demographic? Yeah. So again, 19% of our texters fill out that survey at the end. Um, so we know they're young. 75% uh, of our texters are under the age of 25, including 10% under the age of 13. Yeah, very young. Uh, we know uh, racial demographics. Um, as I said, 18% identify as Hispanic, 10.6% identify as black or African American, 5% uh, as Native American, 44% uh, identify as LGBTQ, um, so we know sexuality data. Uh, what else do we know? Oh, uh, we know, so that's just what they tell us, so that's explicit data. 
We also have implicit data, so things people don't tell us, but we can pull ourselves. So for example, if you take the nation's lowest 10% by socioeconomic status area codes, those area codes use 19% of our volume. So we double over index the poorest people in America. Um, we can also plot those area codes, <coughs> rural and urban, and we know that we skew rural. So we have a lot of demographic data. Um, go here, and then I'll come back to you, Diego. Go ahead. Um, quick question. Um, do you think that the people, policy, and product solutions um, can apply to decreasing the rate of homelessness and increasing the success of affordable housing, like that type of social service? Do you? I think so, but you're the... <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like, but I'm not in the... Here's the thing. Um, uh, I'm not an expert I'm in that. that. Okay. Too. I, know that this I hope so. Grow. Here's the thing. I hope right. so. I hope that there are products and ways to solve this. I mean, with, for every issue. Where homelessness is concerned. Um, I brought that up because you brought up the. Yeah. You've you got to start with dignity. And so I'm not certain it would be. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I'll work on this in the train home. Um, I'm not sure how a product could help bring dignity to a people who right now are just kind of ignored and disrespected. Um, but there probably is a solution. May have to be someone smarter than me who comes up with it. Okay, Diego, and then we'll go in the back of the room. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of know this already, but anyway, um, <laughs> how are you uh, involving uh, texters with disabilities? Um, and the other piece to Nancy is you're not you're not a coder. So how did you start thinking about products? Uh, you know where you didn't study coding. Okay, great question. You want to take the first part, I'll take the second part. Sure, so I'm not sure about accessibility for the texters, but as far as staff, we do have a supervisor who is deaf and hard of hearing, um, and we also have a couple of volunteers, crisis counselors, who are either blind or deaf. I know one who actually uses a screen reader, so it tells her everything that's happening on the screen, tells her what color the conversations are, et cetera. So, we make sure that the community, the products are accessible to our community. We have an accessibility committee that's looking at this across the board. Um, and the second part of your question was, oh, I don't write code. Thank you. This is a good question. Um, no, I don't write code. And if, uh, if you have to write code to be a leader of a tech company, we're just going to keep women and people of color out of tech companies. Um, so fuck that. I run a tech company. Um, in fact, I founded a tech company. And um, it's crushing. And nope, I don't write code. And I'm old. Next. <laughs> Back of the room. Yeah, so I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit more about how uh, generalizable your model is to other social change organizations. And specifically, a lot of community-based organizations are dealing with notoriously small data. They don't have the volume that you have, and they don't operate on tech platforms that would lend themselves to at least currently lend themselves to this kind of analysis. And so, uh, and don't have the capacity to hire one, let alone four data scientists. Yep. So I guess, big picture, it seems like there's a fragmentation issue. A lot of, there's a lot of data out there. It's just held by a lot of different people who don't yep. necessarily know how to use it. Um, and we on a, the Urban Institute on a small scale here in DC through projects like Measure for Change work with organizations to help them better use their data, but they're not going to get to where you are. Um, how do we get there? Is there a, is there a way to I get commun question. small yeah. community struggling community organizations to do a better job sharing data with each other and understanding yeah. what it means? So I think um, there are a couple answers to that. That's a great question. So one is, yes, you answered your own question, aggregating data sets. Um, of course, that's hard because they're not apples to apples. And as we said, collection, storage, analysis. Everyone jumps to the analysis. It depends on the collection and storage. So you've got to get organizations to agree on definitions, to agree on software, and again, how you're going to collect and store and how you're going to share. But if you can do that, um, so for example, um, DJ Patil, who was the chief, he was carrying a blue lightsaber. He was the first chief data scientist of the United States. He's no longer there. Um, but um, he was bringing together police departments um, and police chiefs to share data sets um, to work on criminal justice issues. Uh, that was awesome. Um, and now private organizations are going to have to do this if the government <laughs> won't do it. So you can play a huge role in this and aggregating those data sets, that's one. And two is, 
It is so much cheaper and easier now than it was even five minutes ago. Um, you know, surveying technology, there's SurveyMonkey, SurveyGizmo, Survey, I mean, there's so many surveys. Um, it's not expensive to do this, and it, you don't need a data scientist anymore to have ETL and to pull that stuff out. The plugin that I was talking about on Slack is called StatHat, and I could actually program that. Um, it is possible to dump data into that and to, to pull it out. It's not, you don't have to be good at SPSS or R or React or any of those things. Um, there's, um, there's lots of ways now to pull, pull data that don't require um, fancy degrees from MIT. I'm just wondering, do you worry about interpretation of data? And so you talked about just opening up the data to anyone, but like the example you gave was um, you shared statistics about the people who use your service, but you said they're under a certain age. And a lot of people don't think that way when they're looking at data. They just think, oh my gosh, look, you know, everyone is cutting themselves. So how do you control for the interpretation of data in your organization if you make it a free for all? Um, I'm, probably too, I'm probably naive on this one. I mean, I really am. The fact that I didn't know the term GR until last week was government relations, and I'm still not really sure what that job entitles, but apparently I, I'm supposed to hire someone who does that. Uh, entails, rather, not entitles. Oh, that was a good slip. So um, I, I don't, I, I'm probably being a bit naive, honestly, because I really do believe that the data, that transparency and sunlight in and of itself is a good thing. And um, yeah, people might miss use it or use it to just make their own case. Um, but I have to believe that some of the like, whew, some of the arguments that are made certainly here in Washington or by policymakers that are based on fear and racism are very hard to make in the face of data. I, I think that people who rest on anecdote and fear tactics will have a very hard time in the face of numbers. And, and again, maybe I'm being naive, um, but I, I I know that a lightsaber can be red or blue. It can be used for good or evil. And um, it's still just the technology. And I, I guess the data is the same way. It probably could be used for good or evil. And, um, and I admit it. I'm a little naive in believing that it only shines blue. I hope I'm, I hope I'm right. Um, I was struck by your comments about being a tech company uh, and really kind of prioritizing risk taking and even the willingness to fail. Uh, I think one of the more trenchant critiques of the sort of social entrepreneurial mindset, at least as it uh, applies to the uh, nonprofit sector, is that sometimes the kind of zeal to fail forgets that on the other end there are people who have to kind of deal with that failure. And it seems like crisis, uh, that, that your, your work is a inc really uh, incredible example of the, the, the challenge of balancing the drive to innovate with the vulnerability of a population. Can you talk about how you manage that balance? How do you innovate and, and how do you uh, open yourself up to failure knowing who's on the other end? So uh, I think there are two things. So one is um, where our textures are concerned and then I also want to talk about our staff and maybe Naya will jump in on that because mm -hmm. um, it's exhausting. And um, so uh, where our textures are concerned, look, we're, we're only, um, there are limits to experimentation um, and uh, we don't risk people's lives. So stack ranking, um, some of the stuff that we've changed along the way, we are, we are very careful, but the baseline is always helping save lives. Um, we're not doing things, what's interesting is um, given the way that we're funded, which you asked me about, like we're not doing things to please a funder, um, which I see so many social service organizations do. We're not doing things, we never sell our soul. Um, there really are limits and um, we have a spine. Um, the other thing though about experimentation and, and risk uh, that I don't think people appreciate enough is the toll that it takes on staff. Um, certainly in an organization where you're dealing with life and death things, and remember our organization is not only 24-7, um, um, a half of our volume comes in a third of the time. So between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. we're on fire every night. Um, and Naya takes those night shifts. Every so night. Every night, <laughs> that's right. And so self-care and um, experimentation are, those are the things that are often at odds. I don't know if you want to jump in on that at all. Well, you mentioned the word failure, and I wanted to speak to that. Because <coughs> each week in our staff meetings, we talk about an accomplishment. You Thank you. You must have, you must have a failure um, that you could learn from and share with the team. 
as well as a goal and a goal and then a request um, for your teammates. And then we also had recently a uh, fail fest where you do a presentation about a major fail that you had within that quarter and you talk about your major learning. So we do celebrate those failures and what we can learn from them as much as we do our accomplishments. The hard thing is we've been taught as social service organizations like every year we're supposed to put out that that like annual report and it's the it's always supposed to look a little bit better than the year before. My favorite is like homelessness, right? Or literacy organizations where it's like shouldn't we have cured this shit already if these <laughs> annual reports are right? I mean, every year it's just a little we're doing great. It's just a little bit better and we don't feel like it's a safe environment to say to a funder or to say to our boss like this is not working anymore. And I know that this foundation is giving us millions of dollars to do this, but it's not working. I think some of it is on us to feel safe saying, this program doesn't make sense anymore. We need to pivot and do it in a different way. And some of it is on the funders and the way that money happens in the not-for-profit sector in particular for them to be open to us pivoting. You know, in the for-profit space, when a venture capitalist backs a startup, excuse me, they push money in. And they expect, like PayPal or some of the others, that they're going to pivot along the way and find a business that makes sense and makes them money. For us, you get a grant, and three years later, you're supposed to be beholden to the terms and the numbers that you set up three years earlier. Forget that Puerto Rico is now totally effed. You know, forget that like, your population is in a different place, that uh, floods have happened, that the administration has changed. You are still stuck to the numbers that you promised three years ago. It doesn't make any sense, it makes no sense. That handshake needs to change. The way that we're all funded in the social change space needs to change if what we really care about is impact and best practices. We need to be free to innovate and fail. You and then these two, yeah. Hi, thank you. I just had a clarifying question about your pizza tracker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we literally do call it pizza tracker. <laughs> How did you get 911 services to cooperate with you and give you information? Go ahead. So it's not done, we don't have that buy-in yet from the police department, so it's actually done manually by the supervisor. They enter it. So when I make the call, I press call made. If I get a call back and say, and they say dispatch will be sent to the home, um, dispatch responded, and I'll put notes to say how the active rescue um, resulted. And they always Sometimes, sometimes. When they don't communicate, guess what information we have in Pizza Tracker? That we didn't get a call We back. didn't even get a call back. <coughs> oh, you had a question. I just wanted to backtrack really quickly. Can you talk through how you bring those realities into your conversations with funders? Like obviously there's a power dynamic, you're showing up somebody's door or at a dinner asking for money, but it seems like you're very candid about sort of the social realities that you're dealing with. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you bring that into those conversations. Um, I am like this 24 seven. <laughs> I curse, I'm direct, this is me. Um, it took me a long time to realize, like, this is who I am. I'm not Sheryl Sandberg. I'm never going to show up in a St. John suit. I'm not, um, I'm sometimes not polite. I'm very direct. And this is how I lead organizations. If I love you and I believe in you, you know it. And if I don't, you probably know that too. And um, why should I treat the funders any differently? I got really tired of being a sycophant. It wasn't effective. And it was wasting my time. And so I decided it was time to be honest with funders. And the more I got to know funders, I realized, they're really good people too. And they're doing this because they also care. They just happen to be having their hands like this instead of like this. Um, but they're just like us. They care about the same things. And so I, um, one concrete example, you asked for a concrete example. Uh, I was in a board meeting and I had the 15 mil. Remember I said I got the five from Reed and then a matching, the two to one match. And I was in, a, in our board meeting saying I had 15 and I'd really like help from the rest of the board to get to 20. And one of the board members texted me across the table, we'll put in three. And I wrote back and said, I want five or nothing. And she said, I'm not sure I can get five. And I wrote back and said, what's the difference to you between three or five? Um, and she said, well, would you do international for five? And I said, no, I'm not going to do international for $2 million. And there's no restrictions on this money. This is unrestricted money. You can be in for five or not be part of this. And like, we just have to start valuing what we do. I said this before, you are tackling the world's biggest problems. Uber isn't, 
Airbnb isn't. And the arrogance of those companies is staggering. When are we going to roar? We have some of the smartest people who are underpaid and are giving so much of themselves to solve the most critical problems in our country. Roar. It starts with us as not-for-profit leaders, as not-for-profit employees, saying what I do matters. It's not cute what we do. It's not adorable. We are not home in the middle of the day watching days of our lives. You work harder than your classmates who graduated with you and went to Goldman Sachs. You do. You work more hours than them. You know you do. And you don't get free baseball tickets. <laughs> it's time for us to roar. I'm, I'm, if I do nothing else, you ask me sort of like, what's next? I'm not done with this. I'm having a great time with Crisis Text Line. But if I do nothing else in my lifetime, I'd like to bring more dignity and respect to uh, not-for-profit and the social sector. Because the irony is that all of our organizations, so mental health, the urban institute, like every organization that's represented in this room, your job is to bring dignity and respect to some issue or some people who doesn't have it now, homelessness. And the irony is that all of us in our jobs are treated like shit by funders, by government, by media. And it's time for us to actually reflect the values that we're bringing to the communities we care about. We matter. We have been holding up the ass of this country for 200 years. You want to know what makes America great? You want to know what makes America great? The not-for-profit sector. We are the only country in the world that has this. No other country in the world has a vibrant social service sector like this. There are some things that government funds because voters say that health care matters or voters say that housing matters or education matters, and they vote for it, and those people go to Washington. And there are some things, like people are willing to pay $28 for a lobster roll, and so lobster rolls get sold, and so that's the for-profit world. But guess what? There's a ton of stuff in the middle, after-school programs, needle exchange programs, all kinds of senior housing. That stuff has always been the middle. Nobody thinks it's valuable. They don't care about those people, so they don't pay for it privately, and no one's voting for it. So government doesn't cut it. And so you know what? That's always fallen in the middle. 10% of the labor force in the United States works in that space. Billions of dollars goes in that space. That space is what makes America great. It's really frustrating. And I am never running for office, but there you go. <laughs> Other questions? Does anyone want to ask a question after that? Yeah. Go ahead. Why don't you take it? Because I don't, you know, I just really don't know where I'm going with this. It is? Okay, great. <laughs> it's about money. Oh, great. How do you plan on sustaining your organization over the long term? Where is the revenue coming from in your model? Philanthropy, block grants, what? I don't know. Um, not dinners. Um, I'm, I'm going to go out and raise a Series C in the spring. I'm going to raise another big round in the spring. I'm going to go out there and do my dance with my hat in my hand and, um, and, my, and my dignity in the other hand. Um, so I'm going to go out there and, and raise more money in the spring. Um, and I think that there are some green shoots on ways that we could be self-sustaining. I think social media and search companies should pay us to handle the bad stuff that happens on their platforms. Some of them already are. But um, when you see people on those platforms saying that they're suicidal or having a hard day, they should get referred to us and we should handle it. And those companies should pay us to do it rather than hiding behind um, the safe harbor rule. Um, uh, so that's one. Two is uh, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to have people, there's healthcare companies who should pay us, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to have someone text us um, when they're having a panic attack than show up in the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack um, and that will unclog the healthcare system. So I think there's something to be done there. Um, and then, I mean, you guys survive off large government grants here at the Urban Institute. Um, maybe that's what has to happen at Crisis Text Line. When it does, I won't be the CEO anymore. I don't know. Working on it. There are also some for-profit subsidiary ideas I'm noodling. Anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet? OK, let's get to them first. Go ahead. In the front. Thanks. Um, I'm really interested in your, in your model that relies on a, a very large um, group of volunteers, which a lot of nonprofits do. They're not tech companies, but a lot of nonprofits rely on volunteers. Yep. I'm just curious if you've tracked with them what difference this is making for them. Like, there's like people on both sides of that phone, yeah. and so I'm just curious how, how they're being impacted by this involvement. So we keep hearing stories about people, how they change in their personal life, and how they're, they talk to their kids differently, or they've decided to go to graduate school now to become a psychiatrist. And so um, I was talking to Wendy Kopp about Teach for America, 
And of course, when Teach for America first launched, everybody thought it was about um, student improvement and student engagement. And it turns out that there's a whole other, has anybody here done TFA? OK, great. There's this whole other thing about core members. 70% of you stay in education in some way or another. Does, does your job now involve talking about education policy or having, are you in the, you're in the 30%. OK. <laughs> OK, so, <laughs> but 70% stay in education in some form or another. And that's amazing. So we're talking to TFA's evaluators about evaluating us and what's the impact of crisis counselors on them and of them um, just in the world. Because we basically now have 10,000 people out there, like a silent army, who know how to recognize excuse me, the signs of depression and suicidal ideation and who know how to have empathy and cultural competency and all that kind of stuff. So what's the impact of that? It's a great question. We're about to pay attention to it. Yeah. Someone else had a question? Yep, go ahead. To a certain extent, we all agree that the governments are the biggest players in terms of social change. Yeah. So, but they don't have the data analysis teams with them. So the only way we can empower the governments to do this is by providing the data products, so which they can directly take the leverage of. So what kind of the products that we can pass on to the government so that they can take the proper decisions? I mean, I'm not sure that I would pass everything on to the government, given the privacy concerns that somebody asked before also. I think aggregated and anonymized data and scrubbing personally identifiable information is pretty important. And I'm not sure that I would, ha I'm not handing this off to anyone. I'm opening it so that government is free to look at it. Like I said, Governor Kasich was smart enough to call us, his office, and say, we're seeing this. How should we leverage this? The governor of Montana contacted us and said, I see we're the number one state for suicidal ideation. I'm going to spread the number. And so I think that's probably why we have 5% Native Americans now texting us, because he's really spread this in Montana. Good move. So. Um, I, I think, again, instead of partnering with government and me maybe handing everything over to the government, it's open it up and let government, entrepreneurs, social change en entities, think tanks, let everybody have at it. There was another one. And then I think, why don't we get these two questions out and then I'll, I'll we'll magic, Naya, we'll magically answer both of them in one. Go ahead, your question and your question, and we'll try and combine them. We'll make like a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Go ahead. Okay. I was struck by your origin story of aggregating the best practices of 11 different organizations, and because there's a ton of fragmentation in the nonprofit sector of organizations working at the small scale to handle yes. issues slightly differently. How do you make the decision to do the same thing as others for comparability purposes versus innovating on yourself? Great question. What you got? Very separate question, I think. I okay, don't know. we'll see. Um, you've talked a lot about what the possibilities for data are, right, and what the opportunities are. I'm also interested to know what you see as the limitations of data um, and, and how you sort of tackle those limitations and talk about those limitations. Um, yep, tough to combine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to keep the peanut butter and the chocolate separate here. Okay, so although they really do taste great together. so. Um, okay, so uh, there are definitely limitations to data. Um, uh, I would say Bob right now, or Scotty, two of our data scientists are probably the most popular people in the company. People just love having them in meetings and defer to them. And what's really fantastic about both Bob and Scotty is that they will say, well, here's the information, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we should do. Um, they are great stewards of the data. They're Pretty fantastic. Same with OnKit. Like all our data scientists are pretty terrific. And they say um, data driven doesn't mean that you hand over the keys completely to the data scientists and stop using your brain. Like instinct still matters, opinion still matters. Um, uh, and also, data only reflects what's happened in the past. It has a high likelihood to predict the future, but. Um, like, people didn't know what was, you don't, <laughs> no one knew what was going to happen last November, apparently. So, um, so that's, that's the limitation of data. Um, and with respect to other organizations, I mean, this is, I think this is kind of an entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship question. Like, do you work with the existing things and try and make them better, or do you start something new? And this looked new enough um, that it, it had to be a brand new thing. 
Um, I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship. Like um, those of you who are here at the Urban Institute or at other companies, like, you should take those existing funding structures and those existing channels and try and make things better from within. I don't think we need more not-for-profits. We need better not-for-profits. Everybody's kind of obsessed right now with founding things and starting new things. Um, it's okay to just be a great COO or to, to run a really terrific organization and make it better. You don't have to start something new. Um, and I got the time limit thing, so I will just say that we are hiring. Um, I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, we are looking for data scientists, especially if you're a data engineer or machine learning data scientist. We have, I don't know, we made an offer to somebody today, so we might now only have one slot open instead of two, but if you're great, we'll always hire. And we're looking for more supervisors. Overnight, please. Yeah. Overnight. <laughs> exactly. More people who like the nighttime. True story. I yeah. like that. Well, you all will have an opportunity to uh, hand your resume over to them while <laughs> over wine. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all on the webcast. Remember to continue the conversation. Hashtag live at urban. And let's drink. <laughs>